Okay, everybody. Um, by my clock, it's 10 after four, and we should get going with the uh, late afternoon session. Um, we've got a few important things. We are going to hear from our platinum sponsor, Amazon. We are also going to try to take a group picture after that and control the chaos enough to come back here and then hear from the uh, Galaxy main project PIs on their annual Galaxy update. So some things to fit in. I just wanted to very quickly, before we do that, a couple of announcements. Um, one is that if you are speaking tomorrow as a presenter, we haven't done it yet, please get your presentation to Jen so she can get it uploaded and all in place that, so that you can make it happen up here. Um, there is also, if you look in the program, a scavenger hunt, which is basically uh, taking a selfie picture at a number of notable locations within the Twin Cities area. If you do that and submit those pictures and have more than anybody else, we're going to give the top three uh, people that can show that a bag full of Minnesota related prizes. So uh, keep that in mind. It may not be that difficult to do. So go snap a few pictures. You might move win a few prizes. And last but not least, um, we do have some travel award fellowship winners, and I wanted to just recognize them. I'm just going to read off their names uh, that, that uh, got uh, fellowships just to defer some of the costs of the conference this year. So let's see, there are three fellowships that went to uh, people from the Cleveland Clinic, and that's Brian Robin Nolt, Fabio Cumbio, and Jayadev Joshi. And then one that's local at the National Marrow Donor Program, and that's Ray Salhuga. So maybe we can just give a round of applause to all the fellowships. Okay, with that, I am going to get off the stage. And our, our first talk is to our platinum sponsor, uh, Amazon. And they are going to talk some to, to us about some options for genomics on the cloud. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I thought I was being clever with this title, but I think, uh, you know, Luke really took the show and actually changed this to, you know, Amazon, we're not free. <laughs> you know, just, uh, just to set what we're going to talk about here, just, you know, genomics on AWS, why would you ever want to do this? Uh, because we're not free. Uh, you know, and then go to some specific services, uh, just as a knowledge sharing. Uh, and honestly, this is, a. Uh, there was a lot, uh, I was surprised by the mention of some of the architectures uh, today, I, I hadn't actually realized that folks were, I, I mean, I knew folks were deploying Galaxy on the AWS, obviously, this is a platform that is used for teaching, uh, for, for um, we've been a long time supporter of this community so that you can have uh, stable infrastructure to teach uh, uh, the community how to leverage uh, a Galaxy. But obviously, you know, whether there's production usage or not, I was, I was happy to see that there was production usage as well. Uh, so, but I'm going to begin with, with why, why the cloud at all for this space uh, way back in 2013. Uh, I came from academia. I was at University of Pennsylvania running HPC infrastructure, uh, supporting genomics course, and, and one ASHG, I believe it was ASHG, or it might have been one of the cancer um, uh, conferences, I forget, it was a while ago. Uh, TCGA project at that time was being hosted at the San Diego Supercomputing Center. It was pretty much the largest genomics uh, collection cohort out there of, of genome sequencing. It was about half a petabyte at that time. Uh, and they gave a presentation on the data coordinating and data distribution service. Uh, and it was uh, roughly eight months into the year and they had already egressed a full petabyte of data out from people requesting this 500 terabyte data set. Uh, and it was growing, it was expected to, and it was accelerating. Uh, and it was expected to, uh, uh, by the end of the year, be 1.5 petabytes of egress, right? And to me, that was a giant red flag, right? And it was actually one of the reasons I, I started looking at cloud architectures for doing science, because how many, how many 500 terabyte copies of TCGA were out there uh, that, that folks were repeatedly paying for, and it was only going to get worse. 
and how much time is wasted with somebody babysitting, downloading 500 terabytes of data. Uh, it sucks, right? So completely unsustainable. Uh, and I started this uh, journey about how do, we, how do we support genomics researchers, not only for uh, changing the model of the compute, with the cloud flipping the, the, that paradigm of download data to compute on it, but really just bring your compute out to where the data lives. And for the most part, uh, the first few years that I, I was at AWS, uh, I spent a lot of time working with the NIH on their policies uh, to allow controlled access data on the cloud. That actually wasn't a thing. Uh, and the other thing that we did is we created this uh, open data program that allowed hosting of, of of the uh, uh, different data sets across different domains, uh, satellite imagery, um, machine learning, image, uh, a lot of uh, textual corpus, and there's actually a lot, uh, quite a bit of, of genomic information in, in, in data sets within this uh, registry of open data. And like I said, the, the references right now are in Sydney. You can like copy it if you guys are finding it a little bit slow, but there's a whole host of other data sets within the, the data set. And that was the first step of really thinking about democratizing access to data for real, for real, right? Because not every institution actually has an HPC cluster that you can rely on. Sometimes when it does have that HPC cluster, you might be waiting on the queue for days and weeks, which, you know, we were fairly well-funded and sometimes our queue was quite long. So the reason I knew AWS is because I actually, while running HPC infrastructure, Half of my research I was running on AWS simply to avoid the queue uh, itself. But I was fortunate enough to have like Daddy Warbucks, very well funded BI. Yeah. Because we're not free. <laughs> 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 so, speaking of uh, other, other things that, that, that are free, uh, you know, uh, what, what services are good for running Galaxy? And I'll just describe a few that, that are there. So, I, I'm a developer relations developer advocate for the HPC, within the HPC services group. Uh, and our group actually uh, develops software for doing uh, tightly coupled workflows, uh, also high throughput workflows for a lot of different domains. And one of those projects that we have is called the AWS Parallel Cluster. This is a command line tool. It's open source cluster management tool uh, that integrates with a bunch of AWS services. And what it does is it stands up a Slurm cluster for you, a scalable Slurm cluster for you with uh, uh, and pretty much creating an environment that's very similar to what you would find uh, uh, in your institutional clusters. Uh, so this is just a subset of AWS services here on the on your left, uh, my right. Uh, there's a lot. It's a big ecosystem. I'm not going to get into it. We, we come out with things all the time, and I hear about it sometimes because a customer tells me, oh, you guys just released this. And I was like, oh, really? We did? It's really awesome. I was waiting for that. Um, so it's just so big. But in terms of what you need for research computing, you have some storage services on the top. You have uh, visualization if you're going to do, again, other domains do a lot more visualization uh, through uh, sort of big applications like uh, um, ANSYS Fluent or CFD applications where they're doing some fancy things outside of notebooks and, and web technologies. Uh, we, of course, have compute. Uh, and then we also have some high-speed networking that is, for the most part, not, not relevant to most of genomics, but, but it is relevant to a lot of other sciences. And then AWS Parallel Cluster uh, orchestrates all of these services to give you um, what you see, what you see over here on, on, your, on your right, um, on your left, uh, right, but, which is a, a Slurm queue, um, a can stand up uh, remote desktop visualization tools with this protocol DCB that, that we developed, uh, as well as on, on the uh, on the far left the, the resilient storage services and then scalable compute. So practically speaking, what do I mean by scalable compute is that you have a queue, uh, that queue can be zero, therefore your compute is zero outside of the head node. And as soon as you start putting in things into the queue, uh, our, our, our systems look at it and start saying, oh, you need, you need uh, uh, instances with at least five CPUs and, and four gigs of memory per CPU. 
uh, will stand up this sort of instance to do your job because that's what Zimmer was, was configured to launch as far as parallel cluster is concerned. You know, launch those until you drain your queue. Once your queue is drained, it'll shut them down for you. So you're not paying for those computers when, when you're doing it. Uh, yeah, we're not free. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's nice. That's really, really nice, right? Uh, to to just not even have to worry about provisioning resources and just scales to a just in time demand. Um, one other thing that I'll, I'll point out, so I will, the, a parallel cluster has a lot to it. So the way that I would say, if you're gonna use this as the core infrastructure for your Galaxy install, uh, you would install like a slightly beefier head node than you would normally so that you can run the Galaxy processes on the head node. Uh, expose that as a as a web port, and then uh, attach on the back end a, a you know either a either DRM uh, uh, drama uh, connector or a string to start whatever the plugin is on the back for your EPC scheduler. Uh, the other thing that I'll talk about in terms of uh, uh, file systems, because this is this is actually really cool, is that uh, a parallel cluster will also not just not just the cluster itself, it'll also stand up a, a full luster parallel NFS for you. Uh, and so we have this other product called FSX for Luster. Uh, by the way, they've just added other file systems, uh, uh, specifically NetApp Quantap. Uh, so you can to, uh, mirror data from, from uh, local if you have a NetApp system into AWS using FSX for NetApp. Uh, and they just uh, announced OpenZRPass as well. So, but I'll show you Luster today, because that's what, what today, what, what, what Parallel Cluster supports. Uh, and, and basically, uh, the FSX for Luster system will stand up a parallel cluster uh, file server for you uh, that's SSD based if you want it to be for, for super resilient access and it'll do the, the metadata caching. But the really cool thing about this is that it actually, um, you can set it up to mirror the metadata from a S3 bucket and say present to me as a parallel file system this, this S3 bucket of the thousand genomes data or the galaxy uh, reference data and on your first ask for that file one it will copy that file uh, into the uh, into the fsx system so it's available across the cluster so it, it sort of rewards you for repeated access of, of files uh, but not only that if you um, start uh, creating files into the um, into the uh, 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 okay. it'll do the reverse, right? As soon as you create a file within the uh, uh, parallel NFS system, it'll cache it back into S3 for you as an object, uh, which is really pretty cool, all, all automatically. And there's a lot of there's a lot more to FSX that you can do across regions. You can you can cache on prem storage, in fact, and use use it as a cache for on prem and and, and, and back and forth. So it's a really powerful system. We don't have enough time to talk about it. Uh, and finally, we just released a few months ago um, a GUI because Parallel Cluster is a YAML file, but while it's it's fairly simple to do, uh, oftentimes you you might have users who just really want a, a, a GUI. Um, you guys know, I mean, Galaxy, right? Everything is command line environment. That's why does Galaxy exist? Because people love it, and they're they're easier to discover the functionality. Uh, they're easier to implement stuff. So uh, if you're if you're looking to uh, deploy parallel cluster or play around with it, we have a bunch of workshops uh, that use this as the basis for deploying a parallel cluster so you can track things out. All right. Back to Carrie's talk about graduating from Galaxy, right? There are there are things when you get to um, operations, you know, like when you when you get to a production system that's doing the same thing over and over. Oftentimes, you're not going to use a GUI for that. Um, you may, but oftentimes you go into something like SyncMake or Nexpo or, or, a, or CWL, uh, which is the, you know, that workflow itself that you're not manually turning it off. It's based off of events, like some files will come into, uh, come into the file system and you either have a daemon looking for the run, run complete uh, file uh, so it can kick off in a production system. It's all sort of automated. And for that, we have a different batch scheduling service called Data Rich Batch. Uh, and it's a, a, you know, it's a fully managed uh, service. 
Uh, you schedule and run asynchronous jobs. Uh, it is our scheduler, right? So it has its own syntax. Uh, and uh, in addition to just being that queue and that job scheduler, it'll also manage the fleet behind the scenes um, for you to allocate the compute that it runs on. And the reason you might want to use batch is because it actually has different allocation strategies for you, including uh, best fit, like give me the best machine that you can get uh, for the things that I specify in my queue. Or if you can't find that, just give me the next best one. Right. So it's called best fit progressive. And it also works off of the spot market where it says, give me the biggest capacity pool of spots so I can be more confident that you're not going to take that machine away from me. And Bash knows how to do that. So it will it will get the, you know, the spot market. I'm, I'm not sure if any if you all know, but we've got a lot of compute. You have no idea how much compute we have. Uh, and so we have something called the spot market, which is uh, essentially uh, un, unallocated compute that we offer at a very steep discount. Uh, but the caveat answer is that we'll give you a two minute warning when you take that thing back, right? So you can checkpoint jobs or you can restart jobs. If you've got a workflow that knows where to start from where it left off, you can just restart it and do things like that. Batch takes care of job retries for you as well. Um, it is container based, so actually it has a lot of, of native plugins on the back end that support you know, this batch and snake make uh, nextflow obviously which I've said but other 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 sort of industry workflow languages that are outside of genomics like airflow or metaflow or dbg or even our own step functions and the reason we tell folks to you know if you got more than two steps in a in a any sort of uh, sort of analysis you should really think about a workflow framework because it does a lot for you, including um, being able to do local development, run it on it, it, you know, your on-prem HPC infrastructures or AWS cloud or even other clouds. It, it allows that workflow portability, especially if you're looking at you know, containers and, and, and uh, containers for the application and, and good separation of inputs versus what's in the workflow so that you can change the input source easily without changing the workflow itself. Uh, speaking of genomics, we actually have a whole division that's outside of the HPC services team looking at genomics as a problem. And the first thing they, they released was this Amazon Genomics CLI. Basically, this is the parallel cluster equivalent for genomics workflow and engines, right? So it supports standing up infrastructure so that you can get uh, fast at, at, at running Nextflow or, or Cromwell. Uh, it supports uh, CWL via Toil uh, and SnakeLink. And the back end of all of those languages is AWS Batch, right? So it, Cromwell itself, we know who develops it. Uh, they're not AWS friendly. <laughs> but uh, but we, we've worked with them to add some functionality to Cromwell that's not been folded upstream yet, but to, to support AWS Batch better. Uh, same thing for for um, for snickling. We are so you know, we are pushing it back upstream at some point. So that's all I had. Uh, I know I went super quick there, uh, but if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer it. There are other things that I forgot to put on here. So you, you heard about the open data program, which is free. So we have some free stuff. Uh, we also have a research grants program. So if you're an academic researcher and want to um, uh, do an experiment or try something out, look up AWS credits for research. We, we um, have a regular uh, uh, call for funding that you can, you can apply for, for, for cl cloud credits. There's of course the NIH Strides program uh, from, from the NIH as well. And there was one more thing that I wanted to discuss. Right, uh, speaking of containers, we've been working with Yarn to push bio containers into um, AWS's um, registry uh, for containers called ECR Code Gallery. We're about 20% complete. Uh, it will, once it does complete, we'll put out a blog post about how you use it and where you how to take advantage of it from Galaxy and other systems. All right, now I'll take a question. I saw one back there. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I see you focus on like yeah, a little bit more traditional HPC workflows. A uh, lot of people are also. Um, 
pay up when I used to do the wrong jobs. Yeah. Can I infer from this that that doesn't scale to that? Uh, or oh, no, no. I mean, Kubernetes again. We're, we're not um, we're not pigeonholing folks. If Kubernetes is working for you to run clusters and workflows, go ahead and use it. Right? We do have a, a, a we do have a managed service, as you saw from an earlier talk, uh, Lasting Kubernetes service, which stands up that control plane. Uh, and the reason you might want to do that is because there's yeah, so I saw this really nice quote on Twitter the other day about the portability of Kubernetes isn't actually the portability of your infrastructure, it's the portability of an operator experience, right? So it's always the people and, and the being able to hire and train and port your skills to other places that have Kubernetes as a native infrastructure is just lowering the bar that they'll become useful at the end. So there's always going to be some some customization depending on where you, where you're deploying Kubernetes to, whether that's you know like Google or Microsoft Azure Kubernetes or or, or EKS that you're at Amazon. There's always going to be weird or not weird, but like specific to the platform uh, things about authorization, the control plane, what versions are supported, how you integrate with other services. Right. Uh, Long-winded answer. It's fine if that's what you're, if that's where your skills and capabilities are, use it. And we're more than help, we're happy to help folks implement on top of the system that they define as, as their core competencies. Um, you had mentioned that the genomic CLI um, is basically run on AWS Batch, but you also mentioned that AWS Batch, since you're using spot instances, your compute might go away with a two-minute warning. Uh -huh. um, so does the genomic CLI handle the snapshotting for you in case Batch goes away? Or no, 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 that has to be done. That's, that's so application-specific. It's always the, up to the application to define how to start workflows again. Right. And if you're looking at, you know, some workflows are, are good about um, uh, knowing at the, at the output level and doing the checksumming on, on your behalf to say, I've already created these files. I don't need to create them again. I can start from here. So that's at the workflow level. That would be at, at Nextflow or, or Toil or, or whatever. Um, batch itself has a simple individual job retry. Right, and it'll rely on the application whether to start from the beginning or, or you know, if it can skip a couple of steps. But that's always going to be application dependent. Uh, ATC is really about standing up the infrastructure endpoint to be able to submit workflows. So it actually supports uh, the GA4GH workflow execution service endpoint stand, uh, standard. I think there was one more. Well, there was somebody behind you, and then you can go. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I have more of a meta question. So in our workshop uh, about bio containers, um, there was a, there was a first race of sustainability of our infrastructure model. So mm -hmm. how dependent are we on commercial entities? So we are using PIO, right? We are using Amazon the free services now for <laughs> reference data. We are using GitHub, which is also a service that we all use that we are dependent on, which is free and that's cool. We have these um, we have these dependencies, right? Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you see that from your side from a commercial entity? Um, would you like us as an open community to more or less use these services more with a contract? Yeah. Uh, should, we, should we be prepared to pay as a community for those services? Is it right that we find to use it open, free, priceless? So that's the, uh, so for the folks online, the, the question about uh, sustainability was raised about, you know, like there is, there is charity here, right? There's a lot of, there's charity by um, uh, commercial organizations to support the open data program, right? Uh, typically what you'll find, and you'll find this true across all of the cloud providers is that their programs are bounded by time, right? So the open data uh, program for the reference data has a two year, uh, contract uh, for for us paying the hosting because we want to encourage use of the data and then there's a renewal just like a grant has a, a specific aim 
and our goal. So I think to your point about how do commercial organizations view uh, some of the community support that we do, we do it off of specific games. And whether you, you know it or not, you know, there's always going to be something there that is tracking, is this useful for the community? Uh, and is it something that we can support for the long term? So uh, at least for us, we, we take the long view of these things uh, and say that uh, these programs aren't going away. They've been there for years. We've been doing this for years. Uh, it, but it is behooving onto who we work with to engage with us to make sure the thing is a success. It's not a drop it in and then we take care of it. We specifically structure these things so that we were still an owner. We're just an enabler to the community and the project itself. And as long as the owner is still a good steward of the community, we are more than happy to keep supporting. No guarantees that we have to find out that in a commercial entity, we can't, we can't do things like that, but neither does the government. Now, on my soapbox, strides took me forever to get, you know, uh, uh, and an initiative for crowdfunding that's even somewhere near the footing of what capital expense uh, things are there for, right? So I think as a community, we have large large problems for thematic funding, not even related to cloud, just people funding for for thematic. So there's a sustainability problem there, and uh, but and I was having a, another conversation. I'm sorry if I'm going off, but I find this interesting. Uh, I, I was having a conversation about how are informatics projects funded today, and they're usually tied to either data distribution or data coordination centers for very large, um, uh, very large projects that are uh, disease centric or, or data generation around the disease, right? And is that okay? Should we be funding informatics for informatics sake? I think Galaxy is getting very, it has been supported uh, very well over the years, and I foresee it continuing. But Galaxy is one project. Should should there be more resilient funding? Should there be more training programs? Should there be allocation? And that only that is only going to come from you, and the funding agencies need to hear it loud and clear, and and to the sacrifice of maybe some other initiative. Okay, I yeah, think sorry. we should move on. Thank you. Um, AWS may not be free, but you are kicking back some of that money to support this community and this conference. So we're I, very thankful I, for I, that. I, so. Yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next phase here is we're going to try to get a group picture. And I don't know how that's going to work. So I'm going to get out of the way. Somebody else knows something about that. I think. So <laughs> you want to give some instruction? All right. So, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and it's strong on me into this. Uh, so if there is a professional photographer or just someone who knows at least a little bit, please interrupt me and tell me how to do it. All right. Okay. the correct screen. Are you sharing? to uh, introduce the next uh, uh, talk here, and that's the annual Galaxy Community Update uh, from the leaders of the Galaxy main project. So I will give it over to them and let them take it from here. Just 
make sure we want to do everything correctly. So speak to the microphone, right? Broadcasting. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the list of people on this talk, uh, which you have in the program, is bigger, but we thought that you know with five people it would be a little. So here is also we come to the consensus. It will be me and Mike giving this talk. Um, so um, before beginning anything, I just want to thank Mike because he took the team under his wing, and it's the same old team. It works very well, and for the past two years, uh, he managed to, I think, improve drastically the spirit of this project. So thank you so much for doing that. Without him, it would be impossible. So please be very kind to him at the dinner and at the bar and so on and all the other uh, events like this. And I also want to uh, thank the entire team. I want to thank Bjorn also, without Bjorn that would be... I want to thank the Australians, the Australians that are here, and also, and also Andrew, uh, because it's been tough two years. This is the first time we're together, so it's it's amazing. So that's the end, and now we're going to start the talk. That's the talk. <laughs> so uh, Galaxy is at 15. It's it's teenager. It's a well-behaving teenager, um, as far as it goes. Uh, and I think in this talk, we first wanted to uh, sort of uh, go back to the uh, philosophical foundation of what the project is about, check if it's still valid, uh, and then uh, go into some of the goals, the way we kind of see what the project should be doing, and then emphasize some of the things that happened in the past year and so. But before doing any of this, um, I want to thank the organizers because as you well know, organizing conferences does not add to your life. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it goes the other way around. And we're in Minneapolis, we're in the University of Minnesota, and this is very special because uh, Galaxy P, I'm well, speaking in galactic language, this, would be, this was the super critical event because Galaxy P is also a teenager. Uh, and uh, so for us, this was incredible because uh, the project that we were building, a uh, different team took it and used it for something we had absolutely no idea about. And the problem is they're complicated, generally speaking. <laughs> so we, we, we all go beyond the same five new plan that's, that's sort of as far as we go. And this was an incredible motivation. And I think the fact that we're here today is because of this. So that sort of, that kept us going. And so thank you, Galaxy P team. Uh, so thank you, again, thank you organizers. Uh, so it's, uh, and obviously thank you sponsors as well for making this possible. This is, as you see in this t-shirt uh, screenshot, screenshot, this is, the first physical conference after this black hole. So it's important. Okay. So uh, let's sort of revisit uh, what sort of we're, we, why we're doing, why the hell are we doing this? Oh, it also doesn't matter your lifespan. So uh, this is one of the original James's slides. Uh, this is from 2019, but you know, we use these slides were used for many years. And, we had a cheesy uh, animation just again to piss him off. We <laughs> really hated that. The worst thing to do is to use crazy. So this would he would just he would leave the room. So, so three goals. This is uh, kind of a you know communist manifesto of galaxy. So it's an absolute, <laughs> absolute thing, completely unachievable, but a good philosophical foundation nevertheless. So three goals: accessibility. This is actually being able to run the goddamn analysis, actually being able to do them. The transparency, which means we can explain how the sausage is made and the piece of paper are made. And uh, reproducibility in the sense that other people should be able to do the sausage as well. So they should get ingredients, you know, and get the same product in the end. And uh, it's still very uh, valid concern in our field. And I think what became clear in the past 15 years is that's also valid uh, concern in all fields that do computation. 
So uh, I think the relative weights of these concepts may be changing a little bit. I will specifically emphasize uh, accessibility. So reproducibility obviously is uh, being able to repeat. And uh, I think Jeremy added this screenshot from Princeton about uh, machine learning research being irreproducible. So it's not just biology people. Um, our collaboration, this is essentially ability to share. So it's also ability to be uh, transparent how I did this. Uh, it's also ability to reproduce things. And uh, in Galaxy, these things uh, such as reproducibility and sharing, they're by design. So it's, a, I guess, the software feature. But ultimately, you also need to be, if you want to do analysis, if you want to reproduce them, you need to do it somewhere. So, uh, you know, the software doesn't run on air. So you need some resources to do that. And that sort of leads us to accessibility. You should be able to run it somewhere. So it has to be accessible to you. And I think in the past, especially Corded showed that accessibility of computation, accessibility in general, ability to do analyses is really not that good. So accessibility is power. Let me sort of explain how this works. Uh, this is Google Maps. There is a town in France called Montpellier. It's on the sea, but it's not really close to the sea. So there's this beach there. Montpellier itself is liberal town. It's like San Francisco. But the people who live on the beach, they're a little more bourgeois. So they really don't want the North Africans from the sea going to their beach. So if you have a car, it's accessible. But if you don't have a car, it's impossible to get there. So there is no laws in France which would sort of allow this discrimination, this uh, segregation. So they, you don't need to, you don't need any laws. You just need to, uh, you just need to remove accessibility. So the tram stops right here. And so you have to walk for, I don't know, 12 kilometers. You can still access it, but we should do it. So this is this the difference between these two things. This is how materials and methods of many papers are. So if you read them, there is some GitHub thing there. There might be even you know little workflow or something else. But can you really walk to that beach? No. So I think one of our primary goals, this is sort of a refinement of these ideas, is fighting analytical inequality. Because the science, the number of people who can do good science is high, not only in the United States, not only in Europe. There is very high level of science in Africa, very high level of science of Eastern Europe and Asia and so on. But these people have much harder time getting access to resources. And even in the place of sort of free, not free, for example, commercial clouds in France, it's difficult to use Amazon because A, it's American, and B, you need to have a credit card to access it. And it's hard to reconcile. And this all goes back to that beach. So I think for the sort of a, one of the fundamental so take home message here is that Galaxy makes analysis accessible. You can use main now, you can go an account, go to the org, go to you, .au, .fr, .be, .es, and you can do them now. And that's, this is, this is, I think, a fundamental value what we bring in addition to everything else. Well, first of all, Anton, thank you for that very generous introduction. And really, thank, thank you so much to all of you. I uh, feel like a massive imposter being here. But over the last couple of years, uh, I don't deserve to be here, first of all. But I feel like you know this has been an opportunity, it's in a, in a, and I'm glad to be here. I wish it was under different circumstances, but I'm glad to be here. I've never met a community that was so passionate and so intellectual and so driven. I remember when I was getting ramped up, I asked Anton, you know, there's hundreds of developers worldwide. There's, I don't know, how many thousands of servers, petabytes of storage, like, where's the chart? <laughs> Where's the chart that explains what everyone's doing? And Anton laughs at me. He laughs at me. We don't need a chart. 
Everyone is so independently driven and motivated and excited. And we are here for this accessibility. We're here to change the world. We're here to make the research better. We're here to do so much. And we don't need the chart. We don't need a top down administration. The bottom up, it's the community that drives us, that drives us. And it's been remarkable. So I, I really sincerely thank you all. Um, it's really a, a privilege to be up here today. And, and I acknowledge and I understand the great weight of it. And it's really a great privilege. So uh, we're gonna continue on and, and sort of comment on some of the things that we've been observing. You know, many of these themes we've already been talking about throughout this whole conference. So it'll just, in some ways, just be the summary of the work that all of you have already put forward. So first of all, some of the easy metrics. If you look at sort of you know, jobs that are running around the world, we've hit some important milestones where in the US and the EU and soon to be in Australia, on the order of a million jobs per month. Thanks to the magic of log scale and exponential growth, we've had about as much growth in the last year than we've had in the previous 10 years. That's incredible. That's incredible that after all this time, there's still continual excitement. We're no way leveling off. We're just getting started. We're just getting started with all the great work that we can do here today. In terms of uh, commits to repositories, this is just one of them of many. You know, hundreds of developers working worldwide, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You know, dozens and dozens and dozens of commits every single day. So there's a very, very vibrant, active network. People just trying to help each other, support each other. Again, add that capability, make that accessibility, bring forth all that science um, uh, to everyone, to the whole world. And we're also here, uh, not in isolation. We're trying to give it all away. We're trying to train people. We're trying to get people excited about the work that we're trying to do. You know, there's this growing uh, community and the, the GTN about the topics, the tutorials, the contributors, you know, just this massive amounts of materials. Pretty much any topic that I'm interested in, I'll, you know, do a Google search. And the GTN is always like on the first page. You know, there's just such a comprehensive repository of validated reproducible workflows. It's just so exciting. This is what we need. This is what's going to extend a galaxy into, into more and more directions. So, okay. so in terms of uh, what was happening, so you heard now. So by the way, if you do want to get to the beach, as a demo. So in terms of interaction with Galaxy, so you need to be able to interact with the software, and uh, well, as you know. So uh, this graph has on purpose, uh, so UI and API have the same weights. Because one of the misconceptions about Galaxy is that it's, you know, it's for people who like to click, you know, you click, you drag, you develop tunnel carpal syndrome, you don't use Galaxy again, this kind of stuff. But uh, it's very important to understand that you can use it via graphical user interface. You can also use it via API. And in our view, in the view of people who develop it, these are equal things. Uh, so I will talk about UI because I don't understand how API works. But, uh, but essentially, uh, there are sort of four groups of things which, uh, which you can think of when you're interacting with. That's history, where your analysis are. Tools, workflows, and data. Um, so, in terms of history, so one of the huge things that happened in the past year is the new history. It, at this point, it looks very much, it functions very much as an old in terms of set of uh, uh, things that you can do. However, it's a completely new, it's a blank sheet, it's a new foundation which would allow us to develop really cool features such as minimap view, such as being able to actually view history as a hierarchical entity rather than uh, just a linear uh, combination of data sets. And we already have very powerful uh, search functionality and it's finally fast. Uh, in terms of tools, we have, again, a new framework for explaining the tool panel. This, there will be a lot of changes in this in the coming months. Uh, so you'll be able to list tools because one of the problems that we have is a good problem. We have too many tools. So it's impossible to find, and I can find them because I've been going through this panel for 15 years. But in general, how do you find cut? Uh, and uh, we in general need to think you actually need a dedicated tool panel. Perhaps, uh, as, and especially now, I don't know, maybe some of the CPR on so single page app. So there are lots of things that are possible now. Uh, in terms of workflows, um, I just want to, so workflows obviously is a way to communicate with Galaxy. This is the way to run analysis. And the birth of IWC would allow us to have curated set of high quality workflows. I mean, everybody can make a workflow. Everybody can deposit workflows somewhere, but these workflows 
are tests. They are versioned, and they are developed by people who actually sort of to know this analysis. So, for example, all our VGP workloads I'll be talking about, they'll be distributed to IWPC, so it's a kind of a stamp of quality. Uh, and in terms of data, lots of happening. So, one of the things is, for example, accessing these remote repositories, such as uh, all the data produced by uh, a thousand, thousand genomes, for example. Uh, these deferred data so the way to select data sets you want the galaxy actually doesn't done more than until they need to be uh until they need to be run and it doesn't account towards your uh, uh this quarter and a new color in galaxy right so it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a huge achievement of the past week and uh, with the, with the cloud uh the cloud uh, so that means these data sets are kind of there but not really they're large data sets this is for example how we analyze which data Okay, on the other half of the of the chart here, we have all the API work that's taken place. At the top of the list has been the implementation of the fast API, the sort of standardization. So basically all the major features of Galaxy now are accessible via an API. This opens up all kinds of new opportunities. We've heard about a, a few at this conference where you kind of script things together that had just never been scripted before. It also serves as a form of documentation. We can actually review, oh, where are all the API calls available? What are the parameters that are associated with them? Again, it's all about sort of exposing this technology in new and interesting ways. Uh, in addition to kind of our internal APIs and our internal developments, there's a lot of sort of activity worldwide going on. If I'd point to one example, this would be the Global Alignments for Genomic Health, the GA4GH, where they developed um, you know, uh, quite a few new APIs talking about how to exchange data, how to exchange tools, how to do user authentication. And, and, and already we have made a tremendous progress in implementing many of these sort of key standards. I think we're pretty close to being the first reference implementation uh, for all the GA4GA standards, and that's going to open up all kinds of new opportunities uh, to be able to do work and research at a global scale. I'm, I'm incredibly excited about that. And, and again, through all these APIs, it's all about um, automation, it's all about deployment, and it's all about creativity, where we can combine components together in ways that have never worked together before, and we can make something new rather than having to reinvent it from scratch each time. So, you know, it, it, it sometimes is a little bit hidden that uh, all these APIs under the hood but I want you to know that they're incredibly important and we're and it's incredibly appreciated all the hard work that has done. Um, so this is about uh, being able to do analysis ad hoc without using specific tools. So we talked about this in the previous GCCs. Um, well, some time ago that just means Jupiter, now it means many things. But in general, in any analysis, you come to the point where there are no more tools. You want to do this or you want to do that. And so in Galaxy, kind of three ways of doing this. It's post analytics using uh, interactive environments such as you know, Jupyter, R, R, R Studio, or for example, Observable, which you heard about yesterday. Uh, also being able to create tools on the fly, that's instant tools and visualizations. So I showed that slide, I think in Indiana, but the basic analysis is that, basic point is that the Galaxy itself, Galaxy proper is good for analysis of large number of uh, data sets, but eventually you get to the point where you know you need to compare this with that, there are no tools. And so I think one of our goals, we've been working on this for some time, but I think we're right in the next year to finally make this robust. So the Jupyter integration and our studio integration are truly robust on, on our main instances. This is going to be extremely important coming forward. Uh, that's, for example, uh, Part of the VGP analysis workflows where you actually you know you sequence genome and now what? So you do this, you do that, and then you want to kind of look at this. And here, for example, that's a little Jupyter notebook which shows uh, gene models. So they're impossible to create in a browser of that kind of example. So it's some custom tooling for this. So the instant tools is the uh, functionality to prevent this. It's a part of the coded workflow. It has lots of boxes. And so one of the criticisms, for example, from state made community is that, well, if I want to cut, paste, and group, and then something, and then I need a bunch of these tools. So it's, it becomes difficult. It becomes unwieldy. It becomes hard to debug. So instead of doing this, probably one cell with pandas, few pandas calls will probably be sufficient to eliminate all of this. And so we do have this. New new interface for interactive environment, which actually allows to do that. So create a custom tool to define inputs and uh, eliminate that 
all of the collection of losses. Again, this will be made robust. And finally, visualizations, and you will hear talk from uh, Sam um, on this. This is uh, more of a uh, constrained way of visualizing, visualizing the data that, as you know, Galaxy has a large library of visualizations. Again, polishing that is one of the goals uh, going forward. Here are visualizations. So as I think we all know, you know, compute is only sort of half the story. Uh, especially in, in biomedical research, you know, we also have to be very, very mindful of the data that also that often sort of dictates the type of analysis we've done. Also, some of the limitations and some of the considerations that have to be taken into account. At the top of the list is the scale of data is growing, as I'm, I'm sure all of you have seen some version of this plot before. We're up to 67 petabytes in the SRA, and that's probably, I don't know, a tenth of the, of the genomics data that has been sequenced in the world. So the scale of this is quite substantial and growing every day. And, we, and Galaxy has to grow and has to sort of um, uh, be positioned to take advantage of these very huge data sets that are now being generated um, in genomics and, and, and far beyond as well. As we heard about, uh, I guess it was yesterday from John Shelton, I'm sure it's someplace here. You know, there's been a lot of work sort of under the hood to support these sorts of very, very large data sets. Rather than having step one be ingesting these huge data sets onto some head node, we can have deferred um, uh, and sort of remote execution of data. We can also imagine different tiered storage classes where maybe you would have you know, very fast but sort of transitory scratch uh, space, but then um, the final outputs can be saved away the high performance uh, storage that will be uh, uh, just sort of a lot more robust, a lot more uh, uh, stable over, uh, over, uh, the pro over an entire project. In addition to kind of uh, work sort of internal inside of a single galaxy, you know, through the Pulsar network, we're actually standing up these servers around the world that can all communicate with each other and enable this sort of remote execution. So instead of having to move data from one continent to another continent, oh, it's just that much more easier to move compute to where the data actually reside. And then finally, um, I'm really, really, really excited about being able to bring your own storage into galaxy so that we can extend and expand and scale uh, as the project sticks in. So on training and outreach, there's been uh, quite a lot of activity as well, right? We've, we've started and made uh, huge progress towards a global hub where all the different sort of galaxies around the world can kind of share infrastructure uh, so that we can have sort of harmonized presentation. Also, it's gonna save us from having to sort of reproduce that uh, infrastructure over and over again. It'll just sort of really simplify the platform, accelerate it, make it that much easier uh, to share. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the training network, there's tons of activity going on all the time. Now, of course, because of COVID, this is like one of the few in-person events that have happened in the last few years. But nevertheless, the network has persisted. There's been new tutorials, new trainings, new webinars, all kinds of events, all about trying to share this information, try to empower users. If I had to point to one example of how incredibly successful this effort has been, it's been the smorgasbord that had about 2,500 registrants around the world are participating, all learning how to use Galaxy, many of them using it for the very first time. Incredibly exciting. So uh, finally, of vacations. Um, this is uh, what really I got up to speed last year, uh, VGP Vertebral Genome Project. The idea here to basically assemble everything because you know, all the genomes, they're very interesting. And we sort of had a kind of idea about that. That was, if you look careful at these screenshots, that's 2007. So galaxy, this is so-called lavender years of galaxy. Specific <laughs> color. And so back then we had this idea to every every month we would publish, because we needed to make it beautiful. So we would publish a picture of unsequenced animals. So in 2007, that was safe because nobody's going to sequence Europe in 2007, and uh, certainly flying fox neither. And at the end of this, we actually published calendar, and some of you might actually have it. We send it to some of the uh, super users. So I don't know, we printed maybe 50 calendars uh, and we send them out. This is probably a rare item now. We were, but it was cool and it was safe because we didn't expect these things to be sequenced. So when BGP was announced, this was like obvious we need to use Galaxy for that. <laughs> and the workflows that Delphine uh, was talking about. Uh, this is a partial list of things of animals uh, that were assembled in the past year. You can see it's everything from amphibians uh, to mammals here, and I think one of the genomes is highlighted. It's about you know four geeks. So you know human is boring, and uh, these genomes are really uh, they're, they're fascinating things once you start comparing them, comparing them, their sex chromosomes, comparing the mitochondria, comparing different gene arrangements, and things like that. So I know Anton just said the uh, human genome is born, <laughs> uh, but I think there's been a, 
<laughs> but necessary. Uh, but there's also been a lot of activity in Galaxy uh, in the last few years to be able to sort of take us in entirely new directions, especially for human genetics. Uh, probably at the top of the list, in, in my view, is the to the NHGRI, the Analysis Visualization Informatics Lab, uh, lab Space. I didn't name it, but it's called the ANVIL. Uh, and this is a federated platform designed to support biomedical research for all of NHGRI. Uh, it's a federated system, so it's sort of composed of many systems talking to each other. And front and center right there is Galaxy. That's our, one of our main portals in order to be able to sort of tap into this uh, tremendous resource. So currently inside of the ANVIL, we have something like 600,000 human genomes that are sort of indexed and available, uh, ready to be looked at. Um, and it's just been, you know, just a really awesome experience to be able to, to, uh, to have this view into human genetics for the first time. This is far beyond any of the, of the previous projects I've ever worked on before. Now, I might ask, you know, you know why another deployment of Galaxy? You know, so uh, Galaxy brings a lot to ANVIL users, so it's, it's a... It's a functionally identical instance of Galaxy, so it's all the features for accessible, reproducive, and inter integrative science with thousands and thousands of tools. And we're going to be able to tap into this very large community through the training network. You know, so there's, there's lots of obvious benefits to Anvil to have Galaxy be a part of it. I also wanted to kind of highlight that uh, being an Anvil, there's a lot of advantages for Galaxy's uh, users as well. So we get at the top of the list, we get access to uh, hundreds of thousands of data sets. Uh, it's in a FedRAMP certified system, so it's sort of set up and um, secure uh, so that you can actually do this work of protected data sets. Um, uh, we can avoid data downloads so that we can just sort of work with the data right away. There's no sort of fixed quotas, so you're not sort of limited to, you know, just a few you know, hundreds of gigabytes or a few terabytes. If, you're, if your analysis demands it, you can rapidly scale up to many terabytes or petabytes as, as your own. Occasionally, you may need to go in and sort of change the tooling or change some of the parameters. So in Anvil, you get to be your own administrator, and you can, and you can, you're actually empowered to do uh, do that. Uh, and and all, ultimately, it's all about connecting data in novel ways and being able to make uh, new discoveries. So this is this is getting set up. It's starting to really work. I'm really excited about this in the future. Hopefully, uh, maybe at GCC next year, uh, we can really see some exciting scientific results uh, come out of that. Uh, in parallel to the work, sort of focused, sort of generally on human genetics. There's been a real concentrated effort as well into in cancer uh, uh, genetics as well. You heard a little bit about that. Uh, earlier today. And it's all about connecting cancer tools and data sets at the national level. Through the Informatics Technology and Cancer Research Program, the ITCR, as well as the Human uh, Tumor Atlas Network, the h Network, you know, Galaxy is really, really well poised now to be able to access huge amounts of genomics data, imaging data, and other sort of cancer-related data types. Uh, the, what's the reason for that? Well, it's, it's obvious, right? We have all the tools, we have this great training network, we have the infrastructure set up to be able to support this analysis, and Galaxy is really central to all this work to make really big discoveries um, about the sort of the uh, underlying causes and hopefully some of the uh, treatments and improvements that we made there um, for individual patients. And as, as an example of what can be done there, here's uh, some uh, sort of listing of some of the uh, key workflows that are now available uh, uh, for clinical and research use. Uh, to, to really empower uh, precision cancer medicine. So we can look at sort of pre-biopsy, pre-treatment, and post-treatment, see the changes that are there, look for recurrences, and especially of metastatic uh, cancers, and then hopefully be able to guide the treatments that are possible. I find this work to be incredibly meaningful, where we can actually help real patients that are afflicted by some of the most uh, horrific diseases, and we can actually provide for them really, really um, strong support. In addition to kind of the primary analysis, you know, looking at the sequences, looking at the, at the images in a raw way, as you heard about earlier today uh, from Germany and others, you know, there's also very, very sophisticated technology to do machine learning inside of Galaxy. So we can sort of tease out those really, really subtle patterns. We can really sort of um, uh, look uh, very, very broadly, you know, even when we don't know what the features are we should be paying attention to through the machine learning, we can automatically discover them. Again, hopefully be able to have new insights, better treatments, really, really support uh, medical care. So pandemic here is in place of COVID, uh, because everybody's sick of it, I understand that. But you might know that we've done a lot of work with COVID. COVID analysis in general, well, what you you know, what you hear, what you read in New York Times, new variants. Well, this is also this is essentially variant analysis, but the COVID was very uh, illuminating in the fact that actually variant analysis in a short genome can actually be very challenging. And uh, we learned a lot of things from that. This was a collaborative effort between uh, the Lord, between you, and also with, with help from, um, from, from South African team and also from NAB. And so there was, there was a lot of things learned, for example, 
how different amplification schemes affect what you actually see as variants and so on. And we have, uh, again, a set of high quality workflows. We work, these workflows are available from uh, IWC. And the plan of this effort is to make them more generic, uh, meaning that making them applicable to any kind of pathogen. Of course, that would require a lot of tweaks. These workflows, for example, work with monkeypox now. Uh, we have efforts related to avian flu uh, and, and obviously HIV and many other ones. So this is a continuing effort to make a high quality set of very important workflows for uh, non-deployed or for uh, for for, uh, for microbial pathogens. Uh, and on the same note, there's this micro galaxy effort. Uh, it's uh, it's a big group of different plants. Uh, this effort is led by Tina Bellini, but you can be um, in go to you. Uh, and this is again um, in in the previous talk, uh, we heard about this deficiency of uh, unsustainability of bioinformatics training and how a lot of uh, bioinformatics comes from large projects. This is absolutely true. And it's felt the most acutely in microbial world because in the microbial world, uh, projects are so small in terms of how much money you need for sequencing. And it's simply unjustifiable to hire actually people who know how to do analysis. And so it's like Wild West, well, or prehistoric uh, Eurasia. So you sort of have lots of little kingdoms. Uh, they don't talk to each other. They all do things. These things are very often completely crazy. Uh, and there is kind of no progress as a whole. So I don't know if we can get kingdoms to talk to each other, uh, but at least we want to be able to provide some way of some free platform that you can actually go and try these workflows at least. And these workflows, again, will be IWC workflows. They will be vetted, they will be high quality, and they will embrace lots of different analysis from, uh, you know, from metagenomics to uh, strain comparison because it should compare to genomics. And one tool that I want to mention that this is our collaboration with NCBI datasets because. Uh, NCBI now has a very good way to get the sequenced annotated, or well, actually all genomes, but in particular uh, microbial and viral genomes. And this is now a data source for Galaxy, and this is an excellent resource. And so we're hoping to make this a fundamental part of the microgalaxy uh, effort. And so finally, um, uh, another misconception that we frequently hear is that Galaxy is just for biology. Well, first of all, I don't think it's bad. Uh, but the second, there is uh, there's a growing evidence that it's not true. I mean, if you look at Galaxy, there's nothing biological there except maybe from some historical data sets and genome built. But other than that, it's not really. And uh, climate effort, for example, and in this meeting, this. Uh, neutron scattering uh, poster that's just from from Oak Ridge. Uh, this is this is this is amazing and so uh, again we really want to try to um, get other fields who struggle from the same problems actually one of the interesting regulations of the last year was that Bjorn initiated uh, initiated um, collaboration with CERN which is of course physics and once we had our first meeting it was discovered that, first of all, the CERN people who are physicists, you know, they think all these biologists are butterflies and flowers. Uh, and suddenly, well, Oak Ridge people obviously <laughs> realized that already. Uh, but they suddenly realized, oh, oh, so first, it looks like they have data, and it looks like they have sort of the same problems, and they it looks like they develop really cool stuff, so maybe we should uh, do more. And uh, I think you're just continuing that. And this is all along the same lines is that. Uh, it's galaxy is suitable for any data science. So that's the, it's not just genomics, but not just life sciences, it's you know, everything which has some dates, some data and tools and, and so on. And again, it's all about analytical inequality, being able to give people ability, a platform to analyze their data. Do you know what that is? 
just to say that we're just getting started. I know we're in our 15th year, but there's, I don't know, 15, 50, 500 years ahead of us. <laughs> there's just so much activity going on. By far the biggest challenge, as we just said, is just being aware of it, being aware of it. So that's why I love this meeting. We're all here. I mean, I've just been thrilled by all the conversations. Again, thank you so much for welcoming me. Thank you so much for being here in person. It is just an incredibly uh, uplifting experience uh, to be here. So thank you all so much. Well, you have the rare opportunity of the leader standing in front of you, so. <laughs> but remember, the eyes don't know anything. <laughs> He'll give you a, a good answer, though, even if it doesn't mean anything, so. Any questions? Nothing burning? How to get to the beach? <laughs> <laughs> well, we did actually make it there, right? <laughs> but on a bicycle. <laughs> we got one in the back of the room. Where is the next conference? Um, we cannot reveal this until the end. The question was, where is the next conference? <laughs> so, so the question was, where is the next conference? And we know, but we won't tell you. <laughs> you have to wait. You'll see. <laughs> or uh, try to drive a piece of Okay, well, with that, let's let's thank Anton.